The following presentation was recorded at the 2011 Southeast Linux Fest in Spartanburg, South Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond and platinum sponsors in 2011 for helping make these videos possible. Testing. Testing. Tonight's the night I shall be talking about a flu, the subject of word association for me. This technique out of living. Okay, um, is everyone having a good show? I mean, I, I, this is one of my favorite shows to come to, and I think the presentations have been excellent today. Um, I, I thank you for hanging out till 5.15. I know you're probably a little, uh, anyone remember that Far Side cartoon where the kid's raising his hand? May I be excused? My brain is full. Um, that's where I kind of feel today, so I'm hoping that I can keep you entertained for the next uh, hour or so talking about open source marketing. Now, as Beth said, I maintain a project called OpenNMS. How many of you, before you came to Self today, had heard of OpenNMS? Anyone actually using OpenNMS? Okay, so I had like two hands. So this is the part of the show where I always lie. Um, quite frequently, I'm invited to speak, and most shows don't want you pimping your product. Um, and I try very, very hard not to, to stand up here and pimp OpenNMS. But just by being here in an OpenNMS t-shirt and saying, hey, I'm with OpenNMS, now I have taken the number of these people in this room who've heard about OpenNMS from about 5% to 100%. That's marketing. And that's what I'm here to talk about today. How does one open market an open source project? Um, you folks who, who uh, attended Mad Dog's great keynote this morning, he talked about at the very, very end, this idea of you've got to market yourself. I mean, OpenNMS, you may not know this, is over 10 years old. We registered on SourceForge in 2000, in, in March of 2000. So we're 11 years old on, on SourceForge, yet only about 5% of you had heard of us. So that obviously means that we're not doing a great job at marketing, which is one of the reasons why I'm here. So marketing. Being a geek, I've always disliked this whole idea of marketing. I'm a geek. I hate marketing. Isn't marketing lying? That's what I always thought marketing is. Because life is like a beer commercial, right? You've all seen beer commercials. And they always start out like this. Unfortunately, this doesn't show up so well in this graphic. But basically, you're at a bar, and you've got your little hipster dude over there, and he's surrounded by all these attractive women. And you've got kind of the plain-looking dude over here. you know. But then the plain-looking dude drinks a beer. And what happens? This is like life, right? Suddenly, he's good-looking, surrounded by attractive women. And this gives you, just by drinking a beer, suddenly, you're happy. That's what marketing is, right? That's a beer commercial. Now, the truth of the matter, and being a geek, I'm very much into truth, is that if you drink a lot of beer, you'll look like this. So uh, this is my Wikipedia page. Um, I didn't create this. Please, God, someone change the picture. But um, this is what beer drinkers look like. This is the honest part about marketing. Now, the problem is, okay, if I'm, not, if I'm not lying, if I'm not trying to portray, hey, you use this product, suddenly you're sexy, suddenly you're surrounded by attractive people, um, what, what is the purpose of marketing? Why do I need it? Well, you want to tell people about your products. Right? So I didn't know anything about marketing. What do I do? I find someone who looks like they knew, knew what they were doing. I, I met this uh, young lady at a conference. She was a marketing person. I said, hey, let me pay you to come 
and, and look at what we do and go ahead and, and, and market it so people will, you know, love, find out about OpenMS, they'll love it, and they'll come and they'll give me lots of money. Well, unfortunately, I mean, she was a great person and, and she gave us some great ideas for the website, but her idea of marketing was this, right? I mean, you, well, you need a Facebook page and you need a Twitter account and you need to do all this social networking thing because then you'll get all these people who will come and they will, will spend money. And so we spent money with her, we did all these things, and the number of qualified people showing up on my doorstep to give me money didn't change one bit. Um, I mean, I, I hate to tell you this because this is the, it, it's, it's, it's definitely below cloud, but not by much. This new buzzword of, you know, social networking, you have to do so. And the fact that LinkedIn just had an obscene IPO um, is just going to fuel the fire. So you're going to see a lot of people talking about social networking. So I'm not trying to denigrate it. It is good. But for an open source business, um, dealing with, you know, trying to limit your marketing strategy to just putting tweets out is not going to work. Um, the, the whole purpose, the whole reason is there's a thing called the sales pipeline. Anyone familiar with the sales pipeline? It's this idea that if you take the possible pool of clients, the ones that actually end up giving you money is much, much smaller. And so you end up with this funnel. And I, I stole this from the Wikipedia article on this thing, so I, I want to give credit where credit is due. So basically, if you have a new opportunity, you have someone who might possibly need your service or product. Um, so you get this new opportunity, you communicate. You lose some people after the initial communication. You're like, hi, I'm Taurus, I'm, I'm open NMS sales, and I want to talk to you about your problem. There's a fraction of those people who never write back. But a, a good portion of them do, and you start talking about it, and then you find out maybe they're a Windows shop. Maybe they don't you know, have enough people on staff to match your product. You know, you start doing some fact finding um, and find out what their needs are, and then you develop a solution. At each stage here, a negotiation, purchase order, et cetera, this pool of people gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So the social media aspect is, well, if you want to make, if you want to make more money, if you want to have more closed accounts, you just need to make the top of the funnel bigger. And that's why the whole social network is. That's why they're like, oh, you just need to tell people what's going on. Well, we found out that that didn't really work. What we wanted to do was we want to match qualified customers with our products. Now, I'm kind of known for, I, I have this, this, this problem in that when you say you're an open source business, the software you produce should be open source software. I know that sounds rather logical, but there are a lot of usually VC-backed concerns who believe that open source software is a loss leader, that you have this little community edition or something you put out there to get people interested to make the top of that funnel bigger, but then you actually make your money on selling proprietary software licenses for the enterprise version. And, you know, I'm not that way. We're a services business. Now, as a services business, it's very, very bad if you end up selling your services to someone who is not a good match. Like, we sell, we sell support for OpenMS. OpenMS is 100% free. We sell support for it. So if, but this assumes you have a certain amount of knowledge that you, you know what an IP address is. You know, it, it's more of a, the services we sell more break fix. You should be able to install OpenNMS, run it, and just contact us when you have problems. We have other services such as training and things like that if you, if you don't. Um, if I end up getting an unqualified customer, someone who doesn't have the experience, and we, we, we never start off with an unqualified customer. Um, we have run into a few when the person who brought OpenNMS into the account leaves, and the person they bring in, maybe they're a Windows admin. Maybe they, they just don't have the experience. And what ends up happening is the number of tickets that get open in our system increases tremendously, and it adds a lot more work for us. At some point, we had one customer that we actually wouldn't renew their support. The, and, and I'm going to tell this, I'm going to talk out of school. The guy, one of the things that OpenMS does is if there's a problem, it'll send you an email. He forwarded that email to the support system. So when OpenMS said, hey, you've got high CPU utilization on this device, it would open a ticket. <laughs> And I'm just like, and we'd have to close it saying, look, you know, 
here's the scope of work. We only answer, we're not here to solve your problems. We're not here to do your job for you. And it, it, it ended up, basically, I contacted his boss and said, look, your renewal's up. We're not renewing. <laughs> we're not going to let you renew because the key word here, qualified customers. We have a certain business model. For us to make money, we need to be matched with qualified customers. And if I just cast my net out there and just hope I'll catch something, you know, it may not work. And that's where I see all this focus on social networks as a marketing strategy fails. You know, how many Twitter followers, you know, it doesn't matter if I have 10,000 Twitter followers if none of them are qualified customers. Now, I ended up having the, the, the luck um, to run into this woman who actually, her name, her name is Margaret, and she had worked with Ogilvy. She had actually been um, a marketing person at HP. This woman understood marketing. She didn't, however, understand open in a mess. <laughs> she had no idea. I mean, she, she, of course, she understood the term open source, but she was not a network management person. She was a marketing person. So she sat down with us, and we start, you know, well, what do you do? Well, we're open in a mess. Well, what's open MS? Well, open MS is the world's first enterprise grade network management application management platform developed under the open source model. And she goes, no, but what do you do? We do open MS. She goes, no, what do you do for me? You know, how do you help me out? I, you know, she is, even though she, she, she didn't have any computer expertise, she represents the, the, the mental place where most of our customers start out. They're like, you know, what does open MS do for me? Well, we do monitoring. No, what, what does it do for me? Most of our, one of our big customers is Papa John's Pizza. They could care less about CPU utilization, disk space utilization, et cetera. They want to sell pizzas. They want to sell pizzas online. They want to sell pizzas frequently. When the Super Bowl goes around, they don't want their system to go down because it interferes with selling pizzas. Sitting here and talking about a particular type of technology does nothing for them. So one of the things Margaret said, well, what do you, you, know, what do, you do? Not what you are, because we are this piece of software, basically. But what we do is we help customers use this software to what end? And so she had us sit down, and she drew this, this, this thing that will stick with me for a while. She drew this thing on the board. She drew these squares. And she said, come up with the top four strengths of your product. Now, I'm going to put it up here, and I'm going to, I'm going to click over to the next slide, and these, these four boxes are going to be filled in. But that whole process took us about two months. I mean, it wasn't an everyday kind of thing. It was probably once or twice a week we'd get together and meet for a couple hours. But the idea was, you know, forget about open source. Forget about selling. You know, look at your company. Look at what you do. And what are the four main things you bring to the table? And so we started looking at OpenNMS, and we came up, and again, I'm not, I, I'm seriously not here to pimp OpenNMS, but it's the example I have, so I'm going to put it up on the board. Um, when it came to OpenNMS, we had these things. And if you notice, the word open source doesn't really appear in here. Because our customers, the people who actually give us money, don't care. Not really. I mean, we have, we, I, I'm being unfair if I say they, they're totally ignorant of the fact, but given the choice between an open source tool that doesn't work and a proprietary solution that does, they would choose the proprietary solution that does because that's what they need. So when we were talking about what OpenNMS does, we were like, okay, well, let's focus on this. It's powerful. It has lots of features, and it's easy to add new features. So it's like, you know, it's, it's powerful, it has lots of features. It's flexible. We can take those features, and because, in, in a large part to its open source nature, and another part due to its architecture, we can fit OpenNMS to various and different uh, environments. Again, one of the things that Maddell was talking about, the square peg in the round hole. Um, he could have lifted part of that from my normal sales pitch. When I'm talking to someone, I say, look, most management tools require to take your processes and adapt them to the tool. OpenNMS as a network management application platform, we're flexible. We can adapt what we do to your workflows and your processes. And in the end, it's those workflows and your processes that make you that that, that make your products valuable. Um, it's scalable. Well, I mean, this is kind of the focus of OpenNMS. We have customers with you know seventy thousand devices under management. We have customers getting one hundred twenty thousand events a minute. 
Um, Papa John's has a, a, an instance of open NMS in over 3,000 of their stores. Um, these, are, these are big numbers. And then finally, the, the total cost of ownership. This is where a bit of the open source stuff comes in, is one of the major pieces. It's like, you know, hey, you know, there are powerful proprietary products out there. There are flexible proprietary products out there. There are scalable proprietary products out there. But where we really shine is, hey, total cost of ownership. Again, uh, I, I really like Mad Dog's presentation this morning, but he was talking about um, how having to, to pay for renewals and having to pay for upgrades and stuff impacts jobs. Um, and so we sat there and, and came up with this. So the idea is you put these four things on and you spend a lot of time. What are your four main strengths? And then can you think of some word, some phrase, something that ties all those four things together. I'm very fond of this, this diagram, and if, if my uh, LibreOffice skills were a little bit better, I would have it all clicky and animated and stuff like that. But what we came up with at OpenNMS was the phrase, get the network to work. It sounds kind of kind kind of logical, and, and, and you probably even don't even uh, have your brain around what that even means. Because we didn't want it to just be a catchphrase. But we said, what, why OpenNMS Group exists is because Papa John's, uh, USA Today, The Gap, all of these customers went out. They didn't buy computers because they like computers. They didn't put in networks because they like networks. They want to sell stuff. They want to keep their customers happy. So the reason they invested in all this technology was to have to, to, to get a greater benefit. Basically, for every dollar they spend on technology, they expect to get X times dollars out of it. And without network management, there's no way to really fully realize that investment. So what we do as a company is we don't do network management. We don't support open NMS, not really. What we do is we help clients get their network to work. And we liked it so much, we actually we have the trademark on it. And so the reason that I have this in the center is this kind of became, as, as, as part of our messaging, when we go to market, we wanted to message on get the network to work. And I actually, we, the, the trademark just came in like a month ago, so I haven't updated this. But if you go to the openms.com website right now, you'll see, you know, maximize your IT potential, get the network to work. That's right there on the front of the .com website. It's not on the .org site. Because the .org website is all about the product. This is, you know, it's scalable, flexible, blah, 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 but this is what the product does. What we do on the .com side is focus on what we sell. And it can be one of the hardest things to separate what your software does from what your business does. Because Margaret was sitting there asking us, hey, you know, I don't care what your software does. You know, what does your business do? What, what, what are you selling to me as... A, 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 a potential customer. Now, when I mention marketing and marketing to your environment and how the projects are, are separate, again, one of the things that always irritated me about the open core folks was that quite frequently if you went to productname.org, they would redirect you to productname.com slash community or something like that. Because it was obvious that their, the, the community aspect of it was very, very tied tightly to their company and their way of making money. We've strived with OpenNMS to keep them somewhat separate. And I was trying to explain to people this, and, and I was having a really hard time putting it into words, but after doing this for 10 years, my community, the people who I consider the project community, they're not my customers. The people who pop in the IRC channel, the people who ask questions on the discuss list, the people who open bugs, the people who do documentation, the people who contribute to the .org, they're not my customers. My customers usually don't have time for that, or they're coming from an HP OpenView environment, and they're like, hey, we just need a solution that works. Yet, most people focus very much on, oh, I got these number of downloads, and I have this many people in my community, so that means that I, I should be worth lots of money. When in fact, you know, actually working, getting into your community and trying to market or sell to your community can be a bit um, uh, counterproductive. So, while I was thinking about this, and, and, and I hadn't really formalized it, a guy named Stephen Wally. Do any of you guys know Stephen Wally? 
Yeah, there's a few. He, he's a West Coast. He's actually out of England now, I think, but uh, mainly a West Coast guy. He did a lot of work with uh, the Microsofts um, when Microsoft open sourced a bunch of their stuff. Uh, I forget what they call it now. Codeplex. Um, they, they've renamed it though. It's something else. Um, but he was involved with that. Well, he did a, a he did a big blog post on this, and, and I stole his graphs. So I want to stress that the next four slides are all Stephen Wally, um, and. He pointed out that in a traditional commercial software business, this is kind of what you do. You have your marketing messaging. What does your product do? What advantages does it have? You have your R&D to create a product. You put that into the customer pipeline and you generate money from it. It's very much the cathedral model and the whole cathedral versus the bazaar. You know, you've got the, the everything is in one organization. They develop the product, they develop the marketing messages, and then they present that to the customer pipeline and hope to generate money. Now, some people say, who come from this say, well, hey, I've got this community. So I can depend on the community to give me code. And I always call this, it's kind of the Tom Sawyer effect. You know, everyone's read, read Tom Sawyer where he, he, he tricked people into painting his fence. And there's so many businessmen who, when they first hear open source, it's like, what? There's people who write code for free and give it to me? This is too good to be true, and I can sell it and make money just like a normal software product. And I've never seen a community that actually worked for any length of time, where they ended up sending this marketing message to the community and hoping to also get this code out of the community. Um, I was talking to one guy, and I, he was a big open NMS user, and he worked for a... a a private equity firm in England. And I'm like, hey, you seem to like this stuff, and, and, and I'm just curious, why don't you buy support? And he said, well, that's what they hire me for. He was a smart guy, and he was you know, very in tune with Linux and open source software and the whole bit, and that was his point. It's like, I'm the one who's supposed to go out and learn how to use all these tools. They pay me money for this, and that's, you know, I'm supposed to fix these problems. Um, and he was a case of the community where you didn't, you know, there was no marketing there. And what Stephen basically pointed out was that there should be a different model where the community is kind of at the heart of this. Where what you end up doing is you work R&D together with your community. And we do. I mean, uh, at OpenNMS, uh, most of the work done in the OpenNMS project is done by employees of the OpenNMS group. The reason is they get 60 hours a week to work on it whereas a lot of our other people are part-time. But we still get significant feature contribution from people who don't work for me. Um, part of that is we set up uh, um, the governing body of uh, the OpenNMS group, uh, of the OpenNMS project is called the Order of the Green Polo. I actually didn't wear mine this week, but um, many years ago I found that we had all these people who were contributing to the project. And um, they, uh, you know, I didn't know them. I didn't have any connection with them. I don't know why they were interested in OpenNMS, but they were you know, spending five to 10 hours a week on the list on IRC, submitting code, that kind of stuff. And I said, I want some way to recognize them. So I took the, the British Royal Order of the Garter and I combined it with the Masters uh, Hunter Green jacket that you win for, uh, if you uh, win the Augusta Golf Tournament, and we formed the Order of the Green Polo. And so if you, uh, if you ended up getting um, uh, nominated to this organization, then you've got a free polo shirt, you got an openms.org email address, you got full repository access, the whole bit. And uh, that's where about 20 people now, I think. Because now, the, we started off with about eight, and then over time we've added two or three a year uh, as things have gone on. And um, you have to get voted in by the existing members. And a lot of the product decisions are, all, are made by this group, um, but in concert with the dot-com side. Because we have, you know, there are things that would probably make the project better, but I have customers who actually pay me to add features, and I'm a pragmat pragmatic businessman, you know, and, and so we focus on what our customers pay us for first. And we rely on the community in many, way, in many ways. Luckily, most of it's parallel. Most of what our customers want is what the community wants as well. But... Um, we do rely on that on R&D and conversations about how functions should operate, what our messaging should be, et cetera. 
And then we use that to actually go into the customer pipeline. And now Stephen has a, um, whoops, so I had only that one. So um, what we ended up doing when we worked with Margaret was, was try to identify um, who we wanted to target. Now a lot of people will tell you, a lot of business people will talk about verticals. And there's a lot of strength in that. Um, the idea is, okay, if you have a, a tool that's useful in many ways, but maybe it's really useful in a medical setup, um, then maybe you'd want to focus on, you know, that as your vertical. Um, at OpenMS, we've tried to be very, very broad, but we had to have some way to, to, to qualify customers. And OpenMS is, an, an, is a platform, and it really requires at least one person dedicated to this. So if someone calls me up and they say, hey, yeah, we're a three-person IT shop. We spend 99% of our time doing Windows desktop maintenance. You know, we, we, you know, tell us about OpenMS. I'll basically say, go buy SolarWinds. <laughs> I mean, I know it's proprietary, but it's pointy-clicky, and it's pretty, and it's relatively inexpensive, and it runs on Windows just perfectly, and you guys will like it. Most of the customers who pay us the most money, they have, not only do they have a person, they have an entire department that all they do is focus on the health of the network. And those are the people we target. And by being able to, and we didn't know that, because, I mean, when you start out, the idea is, I want to sell to anybody. But the problem is, you have limited amount of time, and you really don't want to spend a lot of your limited time focusing on people who aren't a good match. Uh, you want to focus on the smaller pool of people that have a much greater chance. And you can't really do that when you're out there just tweeting away. And you can't do that with Facebook, and you can't do that uh, just trying to, to uh, talk to everybody. So another thing Margaret gave us was um, Margaret came to us and said, one of the things that really sells is customer stories. Um, so it's very difficult, especially with a lot of our customers, to actually get them to let us use their name you know, and actually say they use this product. Uh, some people are so security sensitive. They don't want anyone to know what products they use because, hey, if there is a security breach and they know, and someone says, oh, I'm going to do a Google and say, oh, this is using this product. I'm going to try and get into this, you know, site. So I can understand that. But we did, on our website, we actually focus front and center. We have pictures of several of our clients. And the idea is that we've got a, 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 the city of Grapevine, Texas. They use OpenNMS to monitor traffic lights. And this sounds kind of silly. Why, you know, why would you want to monitor traffic lights? Well, Grapevine, Texas is right outside of Dallas-Fort Worth. It's where the stadium for the Super Bowl is. And if you guys will remember this year, just before the Super Bowl, they had a huge snowstorm. So while everyone was flying in to watch the Super Bowl, the streets were backed up, the airport was backed up, there was a foot of snow on the ground in Texas. Well, they were able to adjust the light timing and find out everything was, that was going right and going wrong on their streets by integrating OpenNMS with their streetlights. So maybe this will help other. So the idea is, rather than have a tweet, if someone comes to our website and says, hey, let's read about City of Grapevine because I'm the city of Spartanburg. Maybe I'll find something I like there. Um, we've got good old Papa John's Pizza. So if you're in a large retail kind of environment, maybe that will appeal to you. Um, Tina Niblett is, uh, works for New Edge Networks, is now part of Earthlink. So if you're a big ISP, maybe that appeals to you. And finally, we've got Andres Bjornsson. Um, this is some work we did pro bono uh, during the Haiti um, earthquake. Um, we helped these guys in Vineo, which is uh, one of Mad Dog's. Um, when I first started talking to Mad Dog, it was because he really likes his charity. In Vineo deploys wireless networks in disaster areas and they use OpenNMS to manage it. And so there's a picture of uh, Andres putting up a, an antenna up on the, the roof in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. So, so the final thoughts, and, and I kind of buzz through these slides. Um, when it comes to marketing, it's like other businesses. I mean, there's nothing special about open source in the sense that you want to increase your number of, the reason you use marketing is to increase the number of potential customers. As I said, when I came here, you guys haven't heard of OpenNMS. Now, in hearing me talk, I don't know if that makes you a potential customer or not. But at least, you know, as far as that sales funnel goes, the top has gotten a lot bigger. And even if you don't use it, maybe you'll sit down and talk to someone else and they say, hey, I'm looking at, you know, I need to put a monitoring solution. We've outgrown Nagios. Have you checked out OpenNMS? 
Word of mouth is very, very strong. Um, define what you do, not what you are. Don't focus on, well, I'm a web server, or I'm a database server, or I'm a network management tool. What do you do? Well, we provide value, we provide consulting, we provide solutions, we get the network to work, those kind of things. Those resonate more with customers than a list of uh, features. Um, your community is not your customer. Um, anytime you turn around and take, even in OpenNMS, there's bound to be uh, a bit of, you know, why are you doing this for free? Why are you spending all this money and, and creating this software and then giving it away? Uh, I, I, one of the things that, that, that struck me was um, I was doing some work in Australia and I was walking from the, the it was actually the, um, the tax department of New South Wales. So here was the, you know, the, we have a, a small list of what we call our evil customers. And they're not evil in the sense that they, you know, they have horns and stuff like that, but it's, you know, they're in businesses that most people, you know, like tax collecting. We had one, one company contact us, they, they, they did traffic cameras. And they wanted to manage the traffic cameras. So they, had they gone, Nebuad, since they're no longer here, I can mention them. Remember Nebuad, they were doing deep packet inspection and then inserting ads into like your HTML stream. So if you're like, you're surfing to your private website, they could actually have it so that there was a banner ad added to the HTML coming from your server, added by the ISP. You know, that kind of falls under the evil, but they pay their bills and um, they used OpenNMS to monitor their stuff. So I'm walking from the, the tax department back to my hotel room and I'm going down the street and this woman in a kimono jumps out of this restaurant with a plate of food and said, eat this. I mean, it was a little nicer than that, but that, I mean, think about it, a stranger hops out and hands you a plate of food and says, eat this. So two things went through my mind immediately. The first one was, whoa, is this safe? What's going on here? What's, what's going on, you know, is this safe? And then the second thing was, okay, what's the angle? If someone is coming to you and offering you something that usually costs money for free, what's the angle? And you look at the Chinese restaurant, you see the attractive woman in the kimono with the egg rolls, and you're like, okay, I eat an egg roll. It's about supper time. And I said, well, I'm a little hungry. Maybe I'll go in and I'll buy a meal here. And I started looking at, that's kind of like open source for a lot of like CEOs. It's like someone's coming out here, use this. What is it? It's free software. So first of all, they go, is this safe? You know, I, I click down and it says, you know, add this free software on the time and that's viruses and Trojans and stuff. So I don't want that. So is it safe? And then the second thing is, what's the catch? Why would anyone offer me free software? And I think that's why for a while this open core model was very, very popular because when they mentioned, well, oh, here's free software. Oh, but if you want those features, you got to pay. And it's like the CEO would nod to them. I figured you out. You know, you're just like regular proprietary software companies. But I understand now. So they were comfortable making the buying decision. When you walk up to someone and say, hey, you know, here's some free software, use it. There's a trust issue. And it's one of the things I think we have to overcome. And perhaps marketing will do that. Being able to show your other customers and say, hey, they trust us. And when you start out, you may only have one customer. But if the customer is willing, you know, you got to start somewhere. Now, um, be truthful. I mean, again, uh, I didn't get as big of a laugh on the beer thing as I thought. I think the pictures are much better if uh, you look at them on my laptop. But um, a friend of mine helped me set those up. But, you know, because beer commercials, no, I mean, you get a big giggle out of them, you know. But the, 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 the title of my talk actually, um, Taste Great or Less Filling, um, that, a lot of work went into that phrase. Because beer manufacturers they don't target the casual drinker. They target what are called casers. And these are people who go to the grocery store and they come out with a case of beer under each arm and, you know, one on their, on their head. And, you know, they already know beer tastes great, but it's like, ooh, less filling. I can drink more beer. And therefore, the company can sell more beer, they can make more money, et cetera. There was actually a lot of stuff went into that whole, am I old enough? Does everyone remember the ads with taste great? That's feeling taste great. Okay. Just not dating myself here. But be truthful. I mean, that will sell. Again, most open source businesses are services focused. Um, you want to find those customers who are good. I was telling um, Jeff this morning, uh, on the way down here, I, I, I get an email and I read it, and it's from a, a, a guy that we've done business with in the past called Shane. 
Well, Shane, he worked for a, an investment firm in, in California. He left, he kind of disappeared. We kept up you know, through LinkedIn for a while. He's now in New York and he says, hey, I'm at this new place. We need to open MS support. Send me an invoice. Easiest sales process ever. Not send me a quote so I can get it approved. Right? Send me an invoice and I'll get it paid. And that came from the fact that, you know, we had built this reputation up. He'd done, done business with us before, et cetera. But I would take one of him over trying to get 20 people who are bad fits to work. So focus on your marketing message to target exactly those people. And, and you may have to figure that. We had to figure it out. I mean, we went through this process, what, a year ago? I mean, it isn't something we've done recently. It was something we sat down with and said, hey, it's time. We've got to do this. And it is starting to pay off. But I think that's it. Um, but I'm more than happy to take questions. Um, not about that nasty Wikipedia picture, but um, yes, sir. Okay, the question was, um, do we actually have salespeople who are actively doing sales? Um, the answer to the question is no. Um, last year, uh, well, at the end of 2009, beginning of 2010, we went from five people to ten. Um, unfortunately, my revenues didn't double. Uh, but part of that was we hired a sales guy and we hired a marketing guy. Um, they're both people I've known. Uh, they, we had every confidence that this was going to work out, and it just didn't. Um, what we found is that at least in selling services, and selling uh, open and MS services, um, it takes a very certain type of individual, and a traditional salesperson um, just doesn't, you know, someone who's used to pushing uh, a product doesn't work very well. Um, I consider myself pretty good. If you can get me in front of the customer, I'm very, very good at convincing them whether or not open and mess is a good fit. If it's a good fit, I can usually win the deal. Um, I can't close a door, much less a sale, but I can get to the point where the customer can make up their mind. We do use Salesforce. Um, the open, did anyone here read opensource.com? There's a website. So there's opensource.org, which is the OSI Foundation's website. Well. Um, Rackspace for many, many years owned the opensource.com domain. And I think it either redirected to Red Hat or they didn't really do anything with the domain. But about two years ago, I think it was two years ago, they came out with um, a website called open, open and, uh, opensource.com. And I write a, a roughly monthly column on this. And my net, one of the columns coming up is going to be on tools. And we looked at Sugar CRM and stuff like that, but we do use Salesforce. Um, because we call them trickles. Uh, most of our sales actually come, people write sales at openms.com. And it'll be, you know, anywhere from, hey, I tried to install it and I'm getting this error, to, to hey, we're, we want to migrate off HP OpenView or Micronews Netcool, we really like your stuff, talk to us, let's do a demo, et cetera, like that. So the vast majority of our leads are, are just, we call them trickles. And a lot of those trickles come because of this activity that the community generates, which is one of those things that it really ties together, is that, um, you know, seeing the fact that we have 50, 60 email messages a day go through the mailing list um, really gets people excited about the fact that, hey, this project's obviously busy. Um, but no, we, 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 we haven't done a dedicated sales force yet. We do have a form on the website that you fill in. It opens a sales force lead, and we manage it that way. Um, but right at the moment, we, we, to be perfectly honest, we have more sales, than we can, more sales opportunities than we can deal with. Uh, and still, it's sometimes hard to, to walk away. Um, one of the, the things I did in the opensource.com was I was talking about, I have this personal hatred for RFPs. Does anyone here have to deal with the RFP process? Don't, I mean, we, we, we okay. I'm sorry, I'm going off script here. But, um, so this can't, let's see if I can get to my email. Uh, while I was sitting here, I, I dug this out of my spam folder. Um, doo -doo -doo, here we go. For NMS, blah, 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 Gujarat and Madhya Pradesh. We are working on blah, 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 tender floated by these companies, and we need this list of stuff. So basically what's happened is there's a company in India um, that has, has put out a tender saying, hey, we, we need this solution. This company has this niche, and they want us to do a lot of work. <laughs> and basically, so the best we can kind of hope for is to be a second 
you know, subcontractor to the guy who wins this job. And trust me, if you've ever been in that situation, anything that goes wrong with the project is going to be blamed on you. And if you hope to get paid, your contractor is going to basically require that you do a lot of extra work that they probably should have covered in the first place. Um, the only, I can't think of an RFP process that we actually went through that, that, that netted us any money. Um, so when it comes to sales process, because it's open source, and I say, look, it's open source. Download it. Try it out. We charge people for demos. Not the usual, you know, give me an hour WebEx and just kind of, you know, talk to me. That's, that's pre-sales. But come, you know, does anyone, the, the traditional proprietary software thing, they do this thing called a POC, a proof of concept. And so you would fly, and you had these sales engineers who would fly to the place, they'd spend three or four days, they'd install the software, they'd get it to work. Of course, it all had license keys that expired in like 30 days. And the idea was that if in 30 days they either bought the software or it stopped working and you moved on. And you could keep a guy on the road, you know, two or three times, let's say that would be eight opportunities a month. And if you landed one, it would pay for itself in the license fees. You can't do that with open source, because if I show up on your site and I install it and I get it working and I show you how to use it and I leave and you don't pay me anything, well, how do I make money? <laughs> You know, the solution's there. I don't have any blackmail of license keys to do it. So we have a project called Getting to Know You, and it's two days. It costs four grand plus expenses. But we'll come out and do this. If you buy a bigger project later, we'll give you some credit toward that. I mean, we, 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 we work on it, but it basically, you pay for our time. That's part of our product. We get the network to work. We don't sell you, we're not selling software. I'm not selling you a piece of an application. I'm selling you a solution. And so you need to pay me. Actually, the column I wrote for, for opensource.com uh, that, that should come out in a week or so, it's called Payday, and it's all about getting paid, and that you should expect to get paid. But as far as the sales process goes, um, we do a lot of, uh, uh, we end up getting almost all of our stuff through trickles. Uh, if you type open source network management into Google, we are the number one hit. We haven't done anything really, we haven't tricked Google into doing that. If you type open source network monitoring, we're on the front page, but... Open source network management were on the, the first hit. And I guess people find us that way, and they find us word of mouth. Coming to conferences like this, I mean, I, I want to stress, you know, I, I love the fact that one of the things they did in self this year, if you came last year, they had like eight tracks. And there were so many good speakers that it's, you know, half the people that are in this room today were in my talk last year. Um, it was just, it was very, very hard to, 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 to focus on what's going. And I want SELF and OLF and Texas Linux Fest and SCALE and all these conferences, I want them to have the pick of speakers. And so get out, put out to, it, it takes maybe 10 minutes to, uh, to do a, a, a paper submission. Um, what I do is I usually pick two or three topics at the beginning. SCALE is in February, so it's like at the beginning of the conference year, whereas OLF and a few of these others are around September, October. It's kind of the end. And so I come up with some taper, paper topics, and I just submit them to all the different conferences, and I hope I get accepted. And then if I do, I can stand up here. I get to meet cool people. I get to talk to people in the hallways. They see my open NMS shirt. It's not just a job. It's a wardrobe. Uh, Land's End, I met the guy from SQL Lite, and he had the same exact you know, Land's End shirt. It cost 100 bucks to get your logo set up. Um, and uh, and that's, that's part of the marketing. And then when, then suddenly I'll get an email. I'll get, I pass out some business cards. Someone will, you know, a month from now, someone will send me an email. Um, one of my customers is Northern Trust. It's a, it's a fancy bank in Chicago. And the relationship I have with, with the guy there is, he's one of my, one of my better friends, actually. And we met at Linux World Expo New York in 2002 as we were trying to get our Macs to talk to the Wi-Fi because we both had Macs at the time. And that's where we met. Six months later, I get a phone call, you know, hey, we, we, we need a new management solution. Can you help us out? And they've been a customer since 2004. And so I'm like, um, you know, the best marketing you can do is yourself. Uh, any other questions? I'm, I don't want to. Yes, sir. Um, part of it's kind of tricky. Like, um, we actually updated our contracts for support, and we actually have a clause in there now that, you know, we do have the right to do this. But um, the process is the, the, the kind of uh, hipster-looking guy with all the women in the first slide. Uh, his name's Phil, and he's a friend of mine, and he does marketing for us. 
And so what we do is, is uh, like we just, we just uh, finished a project at The Gap. And so what I'll do is next week I'll have Phil contact the people at The Gap and say, how was the presentation? Hey, I'm a neutral party because he doesn't work, you know, he's not an employee. We'll get honest feedback and if they're willing, he'll ask them a bunch of questions and we'll put together a testimonial. And we put them up on the website. Um, I actually have a couple of testimonials um, that were just literally waiting on approval. Because the process is, he does the interview, he writes it up, uh, we edit it, we send it back to the customer and get them approved. But that we have one customer in a, a private equity firm in New York that we're not even allowed to use the, we're not even, I'm not, I can't tell you they exist. It's like the name of the company, which is top secret, it has two letters um, in the initials. It's like two letters, I'm giving a lot away there. He says the name only appears on the check. They're not on the door. You know what private equity firms are? They're, they're where a bunch of rich guys hire a bunch of smart guys to make them richer guys. And if you've ever gone, they usually have really dingy office space with top-notch gear. You walk in, there'll be six, seven monitors and all this other stuff because they, they basically write computer programs to take advantages and discrepancies in the market and make money. And um, so they really love open source software because they don't want to let an HP into their environment. They don't want to, I remember I was at one firm in Chicago. We have a number of these firms. Uh, one firm in Chicago, and I was showing them how you can send events to OpenNMS just by connecting to a port and spilling some XML. And in 20 minutes, he had, he had modified his app to start sending custom events into OpenNMS. Um, and he loved it. Um, but we weren't even, you know, it's one of those customers, I can't tell they exist. So, yeah, it's hard. I mean, we've got great customers, but getting them, and sitting in an environment like this and saying that, you know, USA Today is a customer, that's not a problem. Getting USA Today to let me put their logo on my website, totally different matter. Um, and so, and again, you just keep, keep ask nicely, uh, be uh, kind of uh, persistent, and sooner or later you may actually get them. I mean, I have two, two um, proposals, two stories that I want to put up um, pretty soon. Uh, and we're just waiting on pictures because we have a certain, there's a little, if you ever go to openmms.com, there's a little rotating picture that goes through. But it's very important because when you're talking to a bank or you're talking to a hospital or you're talking to a university, they really, really want to know that there are other people out there using their stuff. And it, it's, because it, how do you, uh, who were we talking to? We were talking a, a little bit in the hallway and it was like, if you want to, if you, if you want to, uh, maybe there's, a, there's an issue coming up on the ballot and you're not really aware of how you should vote. What do you do? You talk to your friends. And you may actually have friends who are very informed about such things. Well, how should I vote? Well, I've examined the issues and I think we should vote no, or yes, we should vote yes. And sometimes I'll just vote like they vote. And so a lot of people like to do what they do. And as Mad Dog was saying this morning, volume, 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 trying to get, get your word out, get as many customers as you can, but you want qualified customers. So is, is uh, Wicked having, uh, you got all these great customers and no one, no one will let you talk about them? <laughs> right, so that, so, yeah. And, and the whole idea is, okay, suppose there's a problem with Wicked or there's a problem with OpenMS. And I did this, I actually found the bug in, in Micromuse. Uh, many, many years ago, and it turned out that Playboy was a customer of Micromuse, and so I was all over the Playboy site trying to find that open port to see if I could exploit the website. I, of course, their management machine wasn't tied to their website in such a way that I could do that, but I didn't, it didn't stop me from looking. So it's a valid concern. Um, but as someone who's, who's, who's starting out and struggling, um, you know, it can be frustrating because you end up seeing, you know, customers that have a lot more money than you um, and they're, they're, they're going out because people just don't know you exist. And I don't know, I, I, I don't have all the answers because, I mean, we were registered on SourceForge in 2000, we're 11 years old, and only 5% of the people in this room had heard of us. Um, but you have now. So again, uh, one of the great things about coming to self and coming to these conferences is it does allow you to, to meet great people, first of all, and then second of all, uh, raise the awareness. Anyone else? Yes, sir. How do you maintain the uh, balance of between the community and you as a customer? Because I understood you mentioned that, of course, the biggest customer always comes from the community and the separate entities. But if you well, it doesn't come. They don't come at the expense of the community. But uh, what we work on 
Um, so it's a good question. I mean, the question is how do you balance community and the commercial side of any open source project? Well, one of the ways we do it is every bit of code we write is available under an open source license. So we don't have that tension. Because I see, I, I remember there was one, one uh, we call them FOPEN source, F-A-U-X-P-E-N, FOPEN source. Uh, one of our in, our, in our space was talking and it's like, yeah, well, it, the guy was very happy because um, one question I always had, they had a plugin architecture and someone wrote a plugin that duplicated something they charged for. You know, so there's a tension if you, if between the, the community and the, and, the, and the company, it's like, well, crap, I go to, I'm, if I'm a, a standard VC back model, I, I have these, I went in front of these people and said, here's some hockey stick graphs. You know, you give me money and we'll start off like this and then we'll spend your money and then we'll do like this and we'll all make money. And part of it's going to be I'm going to license this feature. So you do your little open source, your open source thing, and then suddenly some guy in the community says, oh, I wrote that feature. Here, I'll commit it. Do you accept it? You know, let's, and then it, the, 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 the uh, philosophical thing is, what if it's crap, but it kind of works? Do you accept it? I mean, because if you do refuse it, then it could be seen that you're refusing it because you don't want to compete with your proprietary version. But to me, open source is all about not reinventing the wheel. And here you had some guy had to spend a lot of effort to duplicate what you'd already done. And to me, that's a broken model. I mean, I, I'm not upset over having some open aspect of your product, of your commercial product to, 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 to gain users. I'm not against that at all. Just don't call it open source. So what we've done is the first rule was um, every bit of code dot com rights is available to dot org. We don't, it's, it's the same repository. We don't hide anything. Um, so we don't have any features that are hidden. Um, the second thing is decisions such as licensing. Um, that was another decision we recently did. Um, it turns out that next week, not uh, starting next Sunday, um, is our annual developers conference called Dev Jam. It's up in Minnesota. And we have 18 guys from five countries, Germany, France, New Zealand, England, US, and uh, Venezuela, so six countries. So we've got guy, you know, 18 guys from six countries and we'll spend the entire week from Sunday to Saturday working on, on code. And um, these people help do make decisions about things like licensing and, and, and how we, what, what we want to focus on as a community. But it's a meritocracy. And so the people who do the most work get the most say. And we end up having a lot of say because we do a lot of the work. Now, I've hired most of the people out of the community. It's great being an employer. I have a list. As soon as the finances um, allow for it, I've got three guys that I want to hire. Boom, 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 boom. As soon as, because uh, we're bootstrapped. We don't have any uh, VC. And so I have to, it, it, uh, hiring decisions are, are a bit painful because we've got to make sure we have enough in the bank and enough in savings to, to make sure that, that we can hire this guy. But as soon as we do, we hire them out of the community and then they get to work. But um, we've never had, luckily, a, a been at loggerheads where something we wanted to do was against what the community wanted us to do. Um, although, I, here's an example. Like, uh, every year at Dev Jam, they want us to work on the web UI for, for OpenMS. And if you've ever seen our web UI, it's very simple. And it was designed that way because you can use it on a phone. And, you know, you can use it anywhere. It's not supposed to be all fancy because you're busy people. You're supposed to be off doing busy things and not staring at a screen. And then you get an alert, and then you go look at the screen, and it's designed. Some people like it. A lot of people don't. Um, my biggest customers, like New Edge and Rackspace, they don't even use the web UI. <laughs> they mine the data that OpenNMS generates, either th directly through the database or through XML RPC or through REST. And they present that data to their customers directly through their own portal. So here's a, uh, here's a question. So again, we're getting ready for Dev Jam. And the guy's like, oh, we need to work on the web UI. And I'm like, no. I'm not going to work on the web UI because it doesn't benefit, you know, because we hear this a lot. I'm like, if someone wants to step up and own that project, I will support you 100%. I'll give you, sir, I'll give you whatever you need. But, you know, from the business standpoint, it doesn't make any sense because it's not going to drive any more business in my direction. You had a question? What about If you think I'm full of crap, too, feel free to... <laughs>
Yeah, well, I mean, we don't have a, you know, for us, uh, it, there is only one repository. There is only one code. If you are a member of the Order of the Green Polo, you have full commit access. Well, there is a lot now. Right. Okay. Yeah. That it's almost that we could spend another hour talking about that. It's because because we it's 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 fine. I mean, I, the the example in this whole thing is is Ubuntu and Canonical and Shuttleworth. Um, you know, Mark Shuttleworth is the benevolent dictator of Ubuntu, self-proclaimed benevolent, and he spent millions and millions and millions of his own money on this. I, mean, I don't see this much anymore, but I used to come to these shows and there were just stacks here, Ubuntu CDs. Boom, 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 boom. Get you some Ubuntu CDs. And it's caused a lot of friction between, you, you've seen the GNOME issues and the Banshee issues. And, you know, as a businessman, Mark Shuttleworth makes decisions that piss other people off. And so there's, there's, some, in, there's some contention between the open source project and how one company is consuming that. Open source project, but I think in the in the long run it benefits everybody just because there you know the stuff that Canonical creates for the most part all of that is under an open source license. So I'm, I'm very much as, as someone who who's run an open source project or been involved in an open source project for ten years now, um, I'm very big fan of show me the code. You know the whole Jeremy Maguire show me the money show me the code because when I started this people would send me email you know. Oh, this is a great product, but what you need to do is, and they send me a laundry list of stuff I need to do. And I'm like, no, it's open source. Don't tell me what I need to do. You know, you run along and, you know, you show, you write some code. You, you do it, and then I'll gladly accept it. And then on the other hand, you get this guy who says, well, I wrote this little piece of code. I don't know how useful it is. I'm not a real good Java programmer. So, and they'd send me this delightful perfectly commented, usable piece of code for this little feature that hundreds, if not thousands of people found useful. And those are the people I tried to attract. But when it comes down to it, I'm a big fan of, you know, Shuttleworth stood up there, he put up the money, he's creating something. And if you don't like it, you can always fork it. Now, we, very, we try very, very hard. We've never had the, the tensions that would cause a fork with an open MMS. Thank goodness. I mean, we, we do allow uh, our community to have a lot of say. I mean, be it from um, when we decided what our copyright assignment policy was going to be, that came directly out of the community. Um, but it is, it is something that's, that's very, you know, if you're using your community strictly as marketing and you're using your community, you know, in that first slide of Stephen Wally, is um, you're going um, to fail. And if you look at o people who've adopted this kind of open core model, um, at least in my space, they're going away. I mean, they're, they're, they're having to either, they're, they're just not doing open source anymore or they're having to radically change their business model. Um, oh, no. We're just, <laughs> we, I don't, I don't want to name names because it's like we're, we're not by name, but, but we're, we're all, we're all um, you know, again, it's, 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 uh, we all have different business models and things like that. And anything that creates more open source code, in my mind, is a good thing. But Google and Microsoft are probably two of the greatest producers of open source code, of OSI approved licensed code um, every year. They do millions and millions of lines of code, but neither of those companies would describe themselves as an open source company. And so that's kind of where it gets into it. I am actually out of time. So, uh, but I'm more than willing to carry this on. I'll be, uh, I'll, I'll be at the, the party tonight. I'll, I'm going over to, to Spot's talk uh, and his keynote in, uh, in 20 minutes. Um, but I really appreciate your time. Um, I hope I didn't bore you. I didn't see anyone sleep, so I'm, I'm glad that's good. Uh, and thanks, thanks for having me out here. What about this? I can help with I like it. it. We have the same problem. What would happen if you did this? You gave me a I found a problem. How do you do that? It's like this. Well, I disagree with it. Let's put the word out.
As a service leader in cloud computing, all we do is hosted computing. To us, the cloud is just the next generation of hosting. And as someone who's been in the hosting industry for 12 years, we feel we're in a unique position to really help bring these two worlds together, these different sets of technologies, and to help companies embrace this new world and this great new tool that allows faster innovation. Not only is it about us being responsive and accountable, but it's about us doing more for you. WebOS, an OS that works the way that you do. Across all your devices, HP Slate and WebOS, HP.